Hey, it's Empire's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. So I found out recently that I'm gonna have a kid. It's exciting news, and when I first found out, the first people I told wasn't my parents or my sister. It was the group chat, you know, the homies, the friends, whatever you want to call it. And I realized that in a couple years, I will have known these losers for literally most of my life. And it's interesting to think about how much our friendships shape us, and that's the theme of today's episode. In a bit, we'll hear about a book that traces two lifelong friends from Karachi to London over the course of decades. But first, New Yorker staff writer Wasu just wrote a memoir about a particularly formative friendship he had in college with someone who challenged his own sense of identity, and more importantly for that age, introduced Sue to a lot of cool stuff. That friend died tragically, and Sue tells NPR's Scott Simon about how that friendship still shows up in his writing. Wasu opens his new memoir with a gorgeous evocation of young Berkeley students driving around and coming of age with Hua alongside his best friend, Ken. Let's ask the author to read from his book, Stay True. At that age, time moves slow. You're eager for something to happen, passing time in parking lots, hands deep in your pockets, trying to figure out where to go next. Life happened elsewhere. It was simply a matter of finding a map that led there. Or maybe at that age, time moves fast. You're so desperate for action that you forget to remember things as they happen. A day felt like forever. A year was a geological era. We laughed so hard we thought we'd die. We cycled through legendary infatuations sure to devastate us for the rest of our lives. For a while, you were convinced that you would one day write the saddest story ever. Wasu, who is now staff writer at The New Yorker and a teacher at Bard College, joins us from Brooklyn. Thank you so much for being with us. It's a delight to be here, Scott. Please tell us about Ken. What you notice first when you introduce him to us is the differences. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, I was a typical sort of 90s alternative person. You know, like I really prized the clothes I wore and sort of my unusual taste in music. And when I arrived at Berkeley in 1995, I was seeking out people who were exactly like me. And Ken was very different. You know, he was really confident, sort of conventionally handsome Japanese-American dude from San Diego. He was in a frat. These are all things that I sort of disavowed as uncool. And so when we initially met, I didn't really think we'd be friends, let alone friends who ended up, you know, sharing a lot of sort of intimate dreams and hopes with one another. What do you think drew you to each other? Could it have been partly those differences? I can only speak for myself. I I was a very uh, immature person, and so <laughs> I think it's more a product of him being kind of open-minded, curious, and kind. You know, the first time we actually hung out, not me judging him from a distance, was when he asked me to help him buy some vintage clothes for a, a party his fraternity was throwing. And, you know, I think he was just really curious what made me tick, you know, why I stood the way I stood, why I was insisted on ordering the weirdest thing on the menu, why I listened to the music I listened to. We're going to play a song for you now. And tell us what it calls up <laughs> in you. I bet you can guess which one. I actually can't. I may not always love you, but long as there are stars above you, you never need to doubt it. I'll make you so sure about this song at length. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. You know, it's a song that I got into in college. Like, I just read an article about it, and I, I sought it out, and it was as good as the article said. And, you know, initially I was really just drawn to how perfectly symmetrical it was. It was just such a beautiful harmony. It expressed this kind of yearning and hope that I... I secretly wanted in my own life. You know, I, I think I prized myself in being sort of sarcastic and not expecting much from the world. And it's a song that I listen to a lot with my friends, Ken among them. And so, you know, hearing it just now, whenever I listen to it, I think back to these late night drives to get donuts we would take and how all of my friends would insist on singing along to it which I found horrifying because it's just such a perfect song on its own and my friends were not particularly strong singers. But, you know, after um, Ken's passing, you know, after the nature of our, our sort of group friendship changed, like I really yearned for 
that sense of harmony again. And I found it actually quite haunting afterwards, this idea that something that felt so beautiful and hopeful at one point in your life could all of a sudden feel almost mocking, you know, just this, this beauty no longer feels so beautiful anymore. Oh, this is, uh, this is going to be hard to talk about. One day you and your friends realized that you hadn't heard from Ken. Mm -hmm. Could you bring us back to that time? Of course, it was um, the summer between our junior and senior years, at least for most of us. And we felt like our futures were in sight somewhat, you know, just that graduation was around the corner. And Ken had moved into this apartment. He was throwing a housewarming party. And I left in the middle of his party to go to a different party. The following day, um, he failed to show up to work. And then on Monday, we realized that he'd actually been killed over the weekend. And I couldn't stop thinking about, you know, leaving in the middle of his party, like leaving in the middle of our cigarette, leaving in the middle of his conversation, and even driving by his apartment later that night and later wondering if it had happened by then or, or sort of whether I had accidentally driven by, you know, his abduction because he was, he was carjacked. Our friends, you know, we, we all just sort of took care of one another and took care of ourselves as best we could. But, um, you know, we were all in, in very uncharted waters without really a sense of what possible routes there were. Yeah. Your friend Ken died in a carjacking, and unfortunately, we probably need to specify in 2022 it wasn't a hate crime. It's an interesting question because even at that time, you know, in the fall of 1998, when we all went back to college, I was editing this Asian American campus paper, and we actually had a conversation on staff. Um, other folks didn't know him, but they'd read about it, and they they wondered if we should write about it or sort of investigate it as a hate crime. You know, there is this sort of broader philosophical question, perhaps, like it's sort of hard not to see people through their kind of racialized identity. So who really knows what goes through the mind of a perpetrator? But according to them, it was a completely random crime. Like it, it just seemed like a robbery that sort of, for whatever reason, spiraled into something much worse. Yeah. Is Ken in your writing, even now? You know, I've been working on this in some form for over 20 years. And during that period of time, I've written a lot of journalism and criticism. Nothing that actually touched on this, but I think the sensations I seek in music, culture, literature, politics, I think there's always been this hope, this humoring of utopian possibilities that actually goes back to this moment in which I was trying to repair the world through writing, you know, in those initial days yeah. after his death. I think he still will always show up in my desire to kind of imagine a different future than the one we have now, because I think for so long that that was the question that, that drove me, you know, this question of the futures that never came. How do friends make us who we are along the way, do you think? It's kind of funny because I've written this book that very much takes seriously this question of friendship, but I wouldn't say I've always been a, a very good friend. I think even though I think the book itself is a gesture of friendship. And I think part of that is that it really took me a long time to realize that we need people to complicate and challenge us as much as we need these people around us that complete us in obvious ways. And I don't think that's something that I realized when I was young. The sense that exposing yourself to someone, like allowing them to understand your flaws, allowing them to challenge why you are the way you are, that's just important as the friend who, you know, plays you the next favorite album of your life or, or turns you on to things because they understand your sensibilities so well. You know, you never know who will complicate you in a meaningful way. Wasu, his memoir, Stay True. Thank you so much for being with us. Scott, thank you so much for this conversation. The two friends in Kamala Shamsi's novel, Best of Friends, end up hitting a crossroads. You know, they're at opposite ends of an ideological divide, and it puts a strain on their friendship. 
And NPR Scott Summit puts this really interesting question to Shamsi, which is, are friendships really meant to last? And she answers that question with her own question. If you loved someone forever, does that mean you should have them in your life forever? Zara and Mariam understand one another as only each other can. Zara tells Mariam all their other classmates are merely in propinquity. But they're the best of friends, two teenagers in Karachi. And the story opens in 1988, who share thoughts, dreams, and anxieties as they grow older, in a friendship that runs from their childhoods in Pakistan to their lives as powerful women in London. Best of Friends is the new novel from Kamala Shamsi, who's won the Prime Minister's Award for Literature in Pakistan, and she joins us now from London. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure, absolutely, Scott. Maryam and, and Zara run in the same circles, but they... Uh, they spring from different backgrounds, don't they? They do, you know, and I was really interested in writing a novel about not just friendship, but childhood friendship. One of them comes from a very wealthy background with a rather ruthless uh, patriarch presiding over the family. Um, and the other one mm -hmm. is from a family of, you know, journalists and teachers and people committed to democratic rule, which there is none of in Pakistan at the start of the, of the novel. It's a novel that really came out of something my sister said to me when we were in our 20s. And she said, you know, the friends we make in adult lives are our friends because we have something in common with them. But our childhood friends are our friends because they've always been our friends. And I, I've yeah. known for a while that I wanted to write about that very kind of friendship. Well, let me get you to read a section that might help us uh, take in the Karachi of their youth. Please read us through a paragraph that takes us to the start of an average school day. Um, right, and this is 1988 in Karachi, and they're 14 years old. The school day hadn't officially started yet, but students in grey and white uniforms were already resettling into their formations from the previous term. The cool kids, the thuggish boys, the couples, the judgmental girls, the invisible boys... Zara had invented these categories after watching a string of teen-centered Hollywood movies on pirated videos, but it did little to make up for the inadequacy of Karachi school life. Without detention, how could there be the breakfast club? Without a school prom, how could there be pretty in pink? Without the freedom required to make truancy possible, how could there be Ferris Bueller's day off? But the one area where the failure was that of the movies, not of Karachi, was when it came to friendship. It was almost always a subplot to romance, never the heart of a story. Story opens in the weeks surrounding the death of the, uh, of the dictatorial General Zia. To help us understand what that meant in a society like 1988 Pakistan, was it sort of like a massive card deck getting rearranged? So I was 15 when that happened, and I have such a clear memory of the day itself. It was August 1988. The phone rang and I answered it and there was an aunt of mine on the phone and she said, are your parents there? And I said, no, they've, they've gone out. And she said, when they come home, tell them to call me. General Zia has been killed. His plane has exploded. And I said, OK. And I put down the phone. And a little while later, my parents came home and I didn't say a thing. And a couple of hours later, my mother ran into this other room where I was sitting with my father and said, Zia is dead. And I said, oh, yes, you know, aunt so-and-so called. And my parents just looked at me and they said, why didn't you mention it? And I said, oh, well, you know, she's full of tall tales and exaggerations. And it wasn't until I was writing for the purpose of the novel that I realized the truth was that this man, this dictator had ruled from the time I was four years old. I didn't believe he could die. I didn't believe mm -hmm. his rule could come to an end. And then I certainly didn't believe there would be democratic elections. People started talking about it. And I kept thinking, don't be ridiculous. And then they said, not only will there be elections, but Benazir Bhutto, this 35-year-old woman, will come to power. And I thought, now you're really being ridiculous. But gradually, this feeling of hope that was in the air, and, you know, Scott, it was the most beautiful time to be young and to be a girl. Did it give you and your friends a feeling that, not just of hope, but that your lives could be fulfilled in a way lives of so many women in Pakistan had not been before? I think it's very hard to say the effect it had. I only know it had a deep effect because, you know, the world, particularly the world of power, 
had always looked male. And that's one thing that in the novel, I mean, both the, the young women in it, Zara and Miriam, you know, they're 14 when Benazir comes to power. They're very moved. And we do see them going on to become powerful women themselves in adult lives. And I think yeah. something gets stirred in them at that point that the world that had looked so male, power looked so male. And then they have this moment of realizing, actually, it can be female. Uh, but of course, the question, which, you know, is a question for a prime minister or for a venture capitalist or for, for a civil liberties campaigner is, what does it mean to be a woman and powerful? You know, that's one of the questions that I think Benazir had to answer and the characters in the novel have to answer. We will explain Zara. They each become very successful in different realms. Zara, uh, a barrister and civil rights activist. Uh, Mariam, a venture capitalist. They wind up with some markedly different views, don't they? There's a, there's a back and forth over face recognition technology that made me hear our future in it. The novel, I think, really does look at those questions and what, what it means to be living in, in the world with things like facial recognition technology and social media and all that. But it, I think, also asks this question of what happens to friendships in moments like this. You know, the novel, I first started thinking about it a long time ago, but the point where I realized I really wanted to write it was 2016. And between Brexit on one side of the Atlantic and Donald Trump on the other, you were suddenly hearing mm -hmm. a lot of people say, I can no longer talk to this person who's been in my life for all these years, whether yeah. it's a family member or a friend, because yeah. we're on opposite sides. And I had the idea then that I want to write about two friends who really very deeply love each other, but they find themselves on very different sides of a divide in a world in which these things can no longer be ignored. Well, that's, that's the question your novel keeps raising. And, and I found myself wondering, are all friendships meant to last or sometimes do they just get us to the next exit along the highway? I mean, if you have loved someone forever, does that mean you should have them in your life forever? There's a very mm -hmm. important moment for me in the novel, which is when Zara's quite angry with Mariam and she calls up her father. And crucially, both these women are living in London and their families, their parents are in Karachi. And her father says, look, here's the important thing you need to know about Mariam, is your mother and I both know that when one of us dies, the first call the other person will make is to Mariam, yeah. because she's the only person we trust to break the news to you. And she has promised us that not only will she break the news to you, she'll buy two plane tickets to Karachi and fly home with you holding your hand because she will not let you make that journey alone. And the question is, how do you weigh up with one hand the weight and the significance of that kind of love and that kind of friendship against the fact that someone behaves in the world in ways you find unethical, intolerable, against everything that your professional and personal values are all yeah. about. How do you balance these two things against each other? Best of Friends is the new novel from Kamala Shamsi. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookofthedaday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. The podcast is produced by Jeevika Verma and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show Elements for this week were produced and edited by Nell Clark, Kurt Gardiner, Melissa Gray, Andrew Craig, Gabe O'Connor, Justine Cannon, Gabriel Dunatov, Ravenna Koenig, and Samantha Balvin. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. 